Ryan Fullen's joining us and he has the audacious task. Audacious, that's my word. It says that you can help us get our message down to three words. Yes. Now it's not in what you say, it's in what you don't say. To pause or not to pause? That is the question. Ryan is an author, a speaker, and a ginger. Yes, sir. You got <laughs> all three. <laughs> And that's what I do. I help people communicate through telling their stories. Ryan Fallen is the human firecracker. This guy has more energy than I've ever seen. That's it. Uh, I, that's what I'm kind of on a mission to do, is to help spread simplicity. But do not mistake simple for easy. The words you choose to use is your competitive advantage. That's something that nobody can take away from you. And the best way to find out what your brand is, is to leverage what other people think your brand is. Hi and welcome back to Fuck the Norm. This week is episode seven and we have an amazing guest. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Take the reins. Well, ahoy. My name is Ryan Foland. And yeah, I think being a ginger, I drum to a different beat. Uh, and I think that my life experience has reinforced that the more original I am, which some people could be considered weird, uh, is what really has given me the strength to ditch the act and focus more on being myself. Uh, honestly, the more vulnerable I get and the more I share what has happened, that's not just good, but that is sort of my mistakes and even my version of ugly. It's what helps me to understand how my experience is related to my expertise. And so I really pull from my stories uh, all the time and I'm constantly learning, but that's exciting for me is to kind of yeah, fuck the norm. And uh, I've been caught up quite a few times in what the norm promises. And it doesn't always deliver. Uh, in fact, it'll move you back further. Because the norm is something that you see that you aspire to be, but it's not necessarily reality. So for those people that didn't see that, he had a label on his head that said, fuck the, uh, no, it said uh, ditch the act, sorry. Um, and that's your book, isn't it? So a bit about, uh, Ryan, you've so I got you a Jedi master because uh, you did karate for a very long time. And do you still do it now? Uh, you know, I haven't studied in a while, but it's been a lifelong journey. And that's the, that's the great thing about martial arts. It's, it's uh, you know, you can never perfect it. There's always levels to get more and more uh, into it. But yeah, I mean, these are, these are like registered weapons in like, I don't know, 67 states. I, can, I forget counting. And you've also used your brand, personal brand specialist as well. Um, yep. You've Some people a- refer to it as is uh, as marketing people. Yeah. Um, I, that's that. I think that's an easier way to look at it. And I've I've fallen into that because a lot of the ventures that I've either started or been involved with have all blown up at a certain point. And if you put yourself and your identity behind that business, then when the business fails or has to uh, go away, then you're left with nothing to hide behind. And so with enough times of things going wrong, I realized uh, it's, it's about being in front and really a personal brand is an insurance policy. And the exciting thing is you have a stake in uh, the content that you create and you get to sort of choose your own adventure based on what it is that you want to be known for Mm -hmm. and what it is that other people think about you already. So it's a moving target. It's an imperfect science. But it's an art, like a martial art, just uh, karate chopping your way to being who you are and feeling comfortable sharing that. Okay. And so your book was based on how to present yourself, how to brand yourself and create a personal brand, isn't it? Yeah. And it's um, it's really an interesting spin on personal branding. Uh, What I got caught up in when I made the decision, had my inciting incident where I'm like, I have to build a personal brand. I thought what many people do, uh, which is like, okay, that means you have to put your best self forward. You have to look great. You have to, all the pictures have to be uh, on point. You have to sort of uh, act as if things are where you want them to be for them to follow up with you. And I tried that and I got no traction at all. And so it was when I started to reveal my human side. And when I started to share the struggles that I had along the way, that people were able to see themselves in my story. 
and people wanted to follow me because they saw part of themselves in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And so really ditching the act as a concept of just being comfortable, being more human, and it's building an intentional personal brand, one that's authentic and not just the, the highlight R-E-E-L, yeah. but more along the lines of a highlight R-E-A-L. And when you're able to be comfortable in your own skin, I mean, the world really opens up and, and you, you essentially fuck the norm and you create your own norm. And that's when people get excited to follow something when everyone's going left. It's like, who's, who's, that, who's that crazy guy going right? Let, let's see what he has to say. Mm. And I'll, I'll be the first to say that not everybody has to like you. Not everybody has to follow you. And we have this misconception about the amount of followers having like a certain amount of, of brand equity. But there's a lot of things that can poke holes in that because it's not about having a massive following. It's about having people who are genuinely excited to regularly consume your content. And if you get good at it and they trust you because they've gotten to know you, then you can turn it into a business. So I, I enjoy working with people who already are professionals. They're already an expert. They're a doctor. You know, they're a lawyer. They, they have their, their niche, but they want to expand. They want to be found more. They want to grow their businesses. And I believe the best way to do that is to put yourself in front of the business and let people know that you're actually a lot more like them than they'd think. And that's what creates relatability. So, uh, you know, you can, you can try to brand with the glitz and glam, but it's, it's not going to resonate. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people are confused of what it takes to build a brand. And I think that a lot of people do the right things mm -hmm. in the wrong order. And so the book lays out a specific way to, to line things up. <laughs> I ask people who are in the process of building a brand they want to, I'll start with like, do you have a bio somewhere online? Yeah. Sometimes they don't. And if they do, if I go look at it, chances are it's not really who they are. It's who they want you to think that they are. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's building a brand is as easy as starting with an authentic long form bio. You know, you said you, you got an idea of who I was. Uh, and it's probably because you found my content, went to my website, you read about me. And I'm like, I'm an open book. I'm like, here I am, all my good, bad, and ugly. But that's why we're connected here instead of pretending like I'm somebody who I'm not. I agree. I agree completely. So that, that's the book. And we'll talk about kind of how you came to that sort of, did you create the principles of that? And that's what you've written the book based on. Um, and apart from that, have I missed anything out? Apart from public, you do public speaking as well. Uh, I do, yeah, I, I do uh, TEDx talks. That's why I found you. Yeah. Yeah. I've got four TEDx talks. Um, you know, I'll, I'll get the fifth once we're back into a real world, but I've been doing a lot of professional speaking over the last five years. And with each year, I've been getting more gigs and raising my fees and learning the business. Um, I have a podcast called The World of Speakers because I was genuinely interested in learning from the best people, uh, just as you're doing here. It's so fun to like pull information and get to know people. So we're almost close to 80 episodes. It's been around for three years. And I ask other speakers who I respect how they deliver their message and grow their business. And so each year has been growing. This year is a little different because my entire booked out <laughs> calendar, I was speaking in Ireland, in Haiti, in Ghana, a lot of international stuff that just is no longer. Yeah. But there's still a lot of ways to support those communities. So working towards the virtual events and, and just seeing what makes sense. Uh, a lot of people uh, who do know me know that I also work in higher education. I work at the University of California, Irvine. And, uh, you know, I, I love the college campus. There's just such an energy with the school. I was initially brought on to start their entrepreneur, entrepreneurship program. Yeah. And since then, I've just moved up in the ranks and work in a communication capacity. So, yeah, I, I think that one of the, at the end of the day, uh, I, I'd say I'm a teacher. And the, one of the reasons why I love to teach is because teaching is a learning experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm always learning and just like a true martial artist, just, just drilling, making sure that that one inch punch can deliver uh, <laughs> the size of a railroad truck if it needs to. So have I, have I missed anything out now? Is there anything else that you're doing? So university teacher, like, well, you're now working communication, book, author, yeah. speaker, Karate. Yeah, so and we covered ginger up front, so I'm a ginger. Uh, I, if I'm not speaking, I'm likely sailing. There's my sailboat back in the corner here, whatnot. <laughs> And I draw stick figures. A lot of people know me for my stick figures. I think uh, I'm just passionate about simplicity. You, you can 
you could tie in simplicity to everything that I do. And there's nothing more challenging than to take like a concept or something and just draw it in like stick figure format. So that's always fun. So I want to, I want to find out, okay, the whole, again, the whole premise of this podcast is to understand how you have arrived at a stick figure, personal branding, public speaking, sailing ginger guy. I mean, I guess the ginger was in the jeans. It wasn't a public, it wasn't a personal choice, but you know, I guess I like to, as I said to you before, I like to go back in time and sort of start around school time and figure out, okay, well, where did you start doing things different? As you said before, when everyone's going left, you were the guy who started going right. So at what points it started changing? Well, I think that in college, uh, I ran into uh, the challenge of not knowing what I want to do, that existential crisis. I was a strong student in high school. So I had the grades, I had the extracurricular activities, and I had my choice of colleges. And when I got in, I got in undeclared. So the college was like, okay, we'll take you. Once you get here, decide what to do. And for me, that was actually pretty stressful because I'm like, you know, you put me in front of a class or a subject and like, I know how to study and learn it, but I wasn't really sure what I was passionate about. Mm. And <laughs> that's when I had my mom help me decide my first, uh, my first quarter of classes. Moms are always good for that. So I'm like, here's the registrar manual. Like I'm undeclared. It doesn't matter. Like the, the first quarter is going to be totally cool. And she ended up enrolling me in a dramatics art class. Okay. And I'd never like, we weren't theater people. I've never like, I'm not just a big fan of like, I, it, my family get on a boat. We go to an island. We weren't like into theater. Mm -hmm. I didn't even really know it existed. It's kind of embarrassing. But I ended up um, finding out how powerful it is to have one-on-one -on -one communication in a, in, a, in a setting where there's the willing suspension of disbelief. And we're at a time we were starting to get stuck to our phones. And so I ended up accidentally getting cast in a play because I was trying to pick up on a girl in class. That's a whole other story. That didn't work out, but I got cast in this play as Marv, who is the, the 350 pound brute in the Sin City comic book series. Okay. And this was an adaptation of comic books and they chose me as the rough and tough dude and I got to use all my martial arts skills, breaking bottles over heads, just like I was able to have like this total freedom of creativity and that sparked my interest in, in live performance. And so I acted, I acted, I produced, produced, directed and really that set the foundation for where I think I went I went left where most people in my position would go traditionally to business or to communications, but I went to dramatic art and then still got a degree in business and economics. Okay. So I have this like We've the business sense. mindset, the economics, I love the math and the systems and then the creativity and the performance. And you know, you can understand what you need to communicate, but if you don't know how to deliver it, mm -hmm your message is going to fall flat. So that's where I really got interested in the mix between the two. And I thought it would translate well to being a Hollywood producer. But again, that did not work. <laughs> uh, I got did you, that? Did, you pursue, that? did you pursue a career as a producer or working in films? I did. Yeah. I okay. tried to get into master's programs and no one accepted me because my portfolio was live performance. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, I didn't see any reality in going to have like, I had no interest in like a Broadway career or anything like that. I, I just love the medium. And so for me, film and television made sense. Nobody would accept me to a master's program. So I went to my network and I found my brother's best friend's sister worked at ABC. So I got an internship at ABC and then I got on the, the set of the practice. And then I got into this small niche advertising company, Moo Productions. So I had three internships, big, medium, and small, mm -hmm. thinking this is the way I can navigate. Well, I found out very quickly that a fresh ginger out of college is the lowest rung, like where there's not even a rung. And I had people over and over, like, like literally slap me on the shoulder and be like, oh, I'm excited to see what you do in 30 years. You're like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, you got to put in your time. It's like, I don't, I don't want to put in my time. Like I'm ready to create. I'm ready to direct. I'm ready to do this stuff. They're like, ha, ha. <laughs> and it was a total reality check. So I burned everything that I had. And when I say had, as far as money, and I, 
I realized those three internships were broke turnships. And I literally just thought that I would make my break until I lost all the money I had. Started calling up friends, found somebody making money in mortgage, and then flip-flopped into sales. It but I not, took... I was going to say, was, it, was, it not, was it not tough? So like, you know, that... Don't forget, yeah, my Hollywood... My, it was, I was crushed. Um, I remember there's a moment because I also studied in, in England, uh, you know, I was, again, I was passionate about theater. So studying business and theater in England and I was at the globe theater and I'm like, ah, like this is what I'm meant to do. I'm like meant to like communicate messages and, and, and get, get into people's heads. And all of that was just a huge bubble pop when I realized that I, what I thought I could do couldn't happen. Now, I will say that for those who are sort of passionate about something and that balloon completely pops, you don't like you can still like you can still blow air into it. <laughs> and, I, and I feel like I've kind of been doing that. I'm still connected with the same people who ran the troop in college. Uh, I've since produced an, a documentary that took us over 10 years to film, which is about the corruption in Venezuela. Uh, we got the we re two, three years ago, we got the Golden Palm Award at the Beverly Hills Film Festival, best foreign film and six other high accolades. We sold it um, on, uh, so it's now sitting on Amazon Prime and two major YouTube networks. So like I've been able to create, uh, I'm passionate about, you know, safety, especially when it comes to digital devices. And we've created a 12 part animated series around a superhero called Crash about sort of a funny cheeky play on texting while driving. So I've had these side projects where I'm able to, to use my creativity, but it's not necessarily something that like pays the bill, especially yeah. automatically. So one, one thing that I've learned is that just because somebody else says you can't do it, it just likely means you can't do it for money, <laughs> but you can still do it. And so, you know, the arts and theater is still a thread that I continue to pull on. And in another example of how I've crossed that over, I, I had friends who had a New York Times bestselling book, but no audio book. And so I convinced them to produce it into a 50s radio style um, theatrical performance. And it started a business around it. it's called business audio theater. It's like who, we're all sick of the same boring audio books. But there was over 90 characters and we had over 25 actors that, that played live roles in, in, a, in a sound space to like create the environment. And for me, that like made the lessons of the business come alive. Yeah. But I stitched that all back to my passion for being creative in communication. But I'm not necessarily like making the money with that. So mm -hmm. I've, yeah, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, that's a really, I really like the idea of that, using actors to play the different voices. Because I, I listen to a hell of a lot of audio books. When I'm driving, and you are right, they're really boring. Unless it, sometimes the author reads them and it's a bit more interesting because they're passionate. Yep. But if it's just yep. someone else reading the book, it's just, you just don't get that vibe. Yeah, we, we produced a full music score, uh, transitions, sound effects, the door opens, you hear the door cracking and stuff like that. But that's an example. And, and the takeaway here for people listening is, I've, I've found my passion in, in theater and in performance and, and in communicating to people in a way that's more than just like a passive communication. And I take those elements and I still, I still play in that play box. At the university, I still have a lot of creative freedom to, to be creative in how we're messaging to the students and the faculty and connecting them. So I, I know this whole concept is fuck the norm, but when the norm tells you that it's not for you, it just means that maybe the, the timing isn't right and they might not see that value. Hmm. There was a, a really a, a kind of a cute story that a friend of mine, Christine, posted on LinkedIn. Uh, I've, I've worked with her in Haiti and Ghana and some of these larger global ecosystems to support entrepreneurship. And she told a story of a grandfather who gave the son a watch. And the grandfather said, I'm going to give this to you when I pass, but I want you to know how much it's worth right now. So I want you to first take it down to the local swap meet and see if, if anybody will give you money for it. So the son comes back and says, Grandpa, like somebody offered me 10 bucks at the most because it's broken. It doesn't look good. He said, okay, 
why don't you go to the pawn shop and see what they think? Goes to the pawn shop, comes back, and he says, you know, they'd only give me a hundred bucks for it because they said it doesn't work, Grandpa. He said, okay, I want you to now go to the museum. And he went to the museum, and they offered him a half a million dollars for the watch. And the lesson is that you can't expect somebody else to tell you the value of something. You can't expect the value to be the same between somebody at a swap meet, somebody at a pawn shop, or somebody at a historical you know, museum. So we all are these like weird broken old watches, but if we try to cash in at the wrong spot at the wrong time, and somebody says, you're not worth it, if you accept that as the fact, then you truly will go a different direction. So I, I feel like creativity and art for me is has been this watch that's not fully functioning that I see value in, and I keep trying to get people to see the value. Uh, and even though they don't, I still know that there's value. And that's the kind of long-term thinking that allows you to kind of fuck the norm, but it's a long-term play, you know? So, okay, you've gone into mortgage. Yes. And that wasn't your passion, I imagine, but it was, I'm guessing you enjoyed yourself. No, no, it wasn't. But, um, but I was natural at sales and there was a sales script. And there was really sales is just building relationships. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to connect with people early on uh, with a gift of gab and a bit of, you know, relatability. You can get people to get to know you. Mm -hmm. When people get to know you, they can like you or not. And if they like you, then they might trust you. And if they trust you, they'll be loyal. Mm -hmm. So I really felt good about delivering what people wanted to solve their problem. <laughs> but it's funny because I ran into a problem. Low man on the totem pole again, over 200 sales employees, mm -hmm. and you get one lead. If you don't sell the lead, you don't get another lead. And so like, it's a totally backward system, right? But it's sales. And it's funny, this ties into stick figures. I've always been into drawing and stick figures. I always liked stick figures. And so I realized that even the very few loans that I was getting past they weren't moving fast enough and then you'd lose the borrower because somebody else would call them up. So what I did is I held something called Friday snack time and I defaulted to like gathering people together. So I made a, an exclusive Friday snack time only for the processors. And it was kind of funny and cheeky. It's like on a sales floor, I'd go buy 70 or $80 worth of salami and fancy cheeses. And like every Friday I'd have a little gathering. I did that so I could get to know who these people are. So I could get to know them. And then when I started to get to know them, I would know that somebody liked mermaids, somebody liked monsters, somebody liked cupcakes. So I would take my leads that I would sell. I would draw an elaborate stick figure. I'd go by their desk and be like, hey, Sue, check this out. Go put it up on the huge stack that would have been totally ignored. She grabs it, looks at it, giggles it, processes it, and it goes like that. The single act of getting to know the people I worked with and, and drawing stick figures around what they were excited about. Got my loans to move faster. I got more leads. I sold more. And I became part of the president's club and then the chairman's club and was in one of the top three sales positions um, as I built that sort of little sales empire that I had. I, I made more money than I knew what to do with. And it was all based on the relationships and creating bonds with people. And I, I, made, I made a lot of money and I should have listened to my parents because I spent a lot of money. I got, I got the apartment. I got the Rimini red Range Rover with red rims. I got a, a Mercedes SL 500. I, I got the nice clothes, the nice stuff. Like I made money and I spent it. Yeah. That's where I got caught back up under the norm. And then in 2008, I, I actually got cocky enough that I got my own broker's license mm. and decided to start my own mortgage company. Mm. After my first loan, 2008, crashed it was one loan that i funded and then everything went out of business and that was a spiral i ended up working in construction selling bathrooms it was the most miserable part and i i, I partnered with somebody <laughs> to start another business and he ended up being a crook uh got in a in a major investigation with the ftc the federal trade commission um that made me age more than I ever have uh, been s more scared than I've ever been uh, became a huge scar letter online. And uh, I, I worked through that and came out the other side 
uh, with no legal action and a, a lot of introspection around choosing the right people to work with. Did so you, I was going to say, did you find, because I've read about that a little bit, but did you find that because you were being associated? Because there's always this sort of, uh, this culture of guilty until, wait, guilty until, start again, guilty until proven innocent. Is that right? But it's not, it's not wrong around, is it? It's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. But actually, but as, soon as, as soon as the media start talking about something and people in your industry start talking about something, that perception is there and you have to deal with it. Oh, even yeah. if you haven't done anything wrong. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but I mean, my problem was that I trusted somebody too soon. I didn't look at the red flags. I trusted that things were okay. And when I accidentally found out that they weren't, I went to the authorities. And at that point they said, this isn't as big of a deal because we're dealing with some other stuff. And I actually, as a result, left the company. Um, and the whole thing came back eight years later uh, as I got served, dragged into it. So, yeah, um, you know, I think, I think one of my biggest lessons is, is uh, being too trusting and working with people who aren't really the right match for me. And I think that if you're looking at your personal journey, I would encourage you to look at the people you're surrounding yourself with. Because if I look back in history, I can look at these blocks of times that went wrong and I can clearly uh, have a direct correlation with the person that I was working with. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get excited about traction, we get excited about success, we get excited about, you know, keeping up with what you've created. And that's, that's the one thing that will get you into trouble if you don't recognize that you're working with the wrong person or that something doesn't smell right. And I feel like in that respect, I've, I've, uh, I'm, I'm wise beyond my years, but I still see the same pattern. I genuinely trust in people. I'm a loving guy. I think people smell my ambition and then I get taken advantage of. And so by building a personal brand, it's mm -hmm. protecting against that. Yeah. Uh, you want. You open the door to your life. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think that what's happened with COVID-19 and even all of these recent protests and everything, it's really making people realize that, you know, the norm is what you make of it. And that's like over a, over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. So I think that the internet has created an ability for people to like pop up and have these like success stories, but it creates a total, you know, disconnect with what, with what the real world is and, and the reality of it. So it's, I think that's what annoys me a little bit. That, that is one of the reasons behind this. So I would consider myself a one entrepreneur, someone who's been trying for years to get where I want to go. I know where I'm trying to go. I'm trying everything to get there. And one day I know I'll get there. But the point is, it's going to take years. And there's no such thing as get rich quick. There's no such thing as popping up overnight. But actually, people perceive that to be the thing. They see someone, they're like, oh my God, look how lucky he is. But you didn't see the nice, the guy or the girl was sleeping in the car or they were working in three different jobs trying to fund the startup or whatever it was. And it, that, I think that's one of the reasons why I like to explore the sort of startup story. And also, I mean, not necessarily startup, depends what the, the industry is, but the journey that they took and why it was different and the sacrifices that they made, etc. cetera. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not always the most direct path, but... And it's funny because, you know, you, you spend just a little bit of time on Instagram or, or another platform and you, 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 and you see these things and you're like, oh, why, why not me? What have I done wrong? That person's younger than me. They're, they're this, they're that. But you can't get caught up in the, in the comparative game. And this is another lesson for people who want to build brands. You know, I'll ask people who are some of the brands that you respect that you, you kind of want to benchmark against. And the people that they identify have been at it for 10, 20 years. And so, you know, for people who want to become the next blank, it's not even a comparison. It's, it's a whole different time. Like you, you can't compare your brand to somebody who started off when YouTube started. Yeah. And so I think a lot of that is used as sales tactics, as ways to get people to, to gain more information. Uh, how, often, but, how, often, how often do people say Gary V? I want to be like Gary V. Yeah. And they don't realize he has the whole content team behind him. He was one of the first adopters of YouTube. I, I've met him. I, I, I saw him in China when we were speaking at the same event. And he's just, he's a, he's a regular guy, but he hustles. He hustles and, he, and he's been hustling for so long. <laughs> I, 
I guess there's some sort of inspiration, right? You look up to these people and it makes you think you can do it. Mm. And I'm not trying to discourage people. I'm just saying that if you do it, do it your own way and, and share the process. I think people are craving authenticity more than ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's one of the, it, especially as a dude, it's hard to dissociate like uh, vulnerability and weakness. But Brene Brown talks about how being vulnerable is actually courageous because you're actually putting yourself out there. And as soon as somebody, this is a concept we talk about in the book about going first. You meet somebody, you're like, oh, hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm good. Yeah, things are good. Oh, how about you? Oh, yeah, they're really good. They're good. Yeah, it's great. Right? Yeah. But in reality, both of those people probably have an issue, whether it's a family issue or something financially or something that's challenging. So imagine you flip the script and you go, hey, how you doing? Well, today's been kind of shitty. Like, you know, I've got this going on and then this is sort of stressing me out and over here. And then you'd be like, oh, my gosh, me too. I was having, I couldn't, it, so, it, you know, we've kind of followed the leader. So to create an authentic brand is sometimes being courageous to step out and go like, yeah, I'm not having the best day. And then everybody jumps in and, and, and associates with that. Some of my best co performing content is stuff where I'm like just totally admitting something that I did as a mistake or bumped into a wall or spilt something or just I'm hungry or like <laughs> these common things. Uh, it's it's counterintuitive. I'm, I'm taking this as personal brand advice because I've been just recently, I just opened the door to my life, right? I just started posting things. And I, I was on a Zoom call just like this. I got a phone call. And I said, sorry, one second. I muted the mic. I had to take the call. Stepped outside. And just before I went, I was talking about uh, people losing their jobs with the coronavirus and issues and not being able to pay the bills. And I said, I don't know if I'm, I'm going to have a job and I don't know how many pay the bills. I came back and I was like, yep, yeah, that's it. I just got laid off. <laughs> and I was like, should we bury this tape? Like, let no one see it, right? Because I'd look like a failure. I've just started a new startup agency and I just failed. And I said to the guy, the guy I was talking to, I said, please send me the recording. I'm going to post it. I posted it out and I said, look, this is what happened. And I was like, I'm just going to go eat loads of chocolate right now. But the point was, I just wanted to share because I know that everyone pretends everything's okay, but it's not, you know? And I, I think when well, you're saying it, I'm like, yes, that's the right thing there. So one of the, one of the, <laughs> yeah, one of the exercises in the book, which might be a fun exercise for you to think about, especially if you're now looking for a job and a lot of people are looking for jobs or for opportunities. You have your resume, right? The magical resume. These are all the good things. Prepare your resume, send me your resume. We have a concept called the exposure resume. It's all the things that didn't make it to your resume. Mm. And the reality is that if you get asked an interview question, about your leadership or about you handle something like when they're starting to get to know who you are and they're asking you those difficult questions, you are so much better off by sharing something that went wrong, mm. what you learned from it and how you've changed as a person and how that has defined the way that you're a leader or the way that you are now. It gives so much more information about you. And so the exercise is what are the things that haven't gone right? What have you learned from it? How have you changed as a person because of it? And now you have these, these stories that you can use in your exposure brain. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you can start a blog with them. It can be inspiration for a video, but it draws people in and you're not just sharing for the sake of emotionally and verbally throwing up on people. You're actually sharing in a way that you're also learning and you're sharing what you've learned from it. So it's, you know, authenticity isn't oversharing. It's not, you know, sharing to get a reaction. It's not, it's not, it's not that it's just about kind of documenting the process so that you bring people along with the journey and that it actually draws people towards you. It's counterintuitive. Yeah. But it actually works. Well, I think I, I've, I, I, so I work, I can't speak. I work in digital marketing and I speak with a lot of clients and a lot of the advice I give them is just, you know, your world, you've got such an online presence that's a shop window now. They can look into your life. They can look into your company. They can look into the people that are there, the core behaviors, the values, whatever. And if you're cagey and you're not open, you're not using those channels to communicate with people, then you're missing an opportunity. And actually those people you know, might go somewhere else where they'll find the answers to see if you align with them as a person, as a consumer or whatever, or even just to build a relationship. So it's nice to actually hear from yourself because you work in that industry and it means I'm saying the right thing and I'm not just there lying to people but I think that was my own personal views of it so I think that's right yeah when I work with clients um, I will actually only work with people who are open to mm. ditching the act 
and I've worked with some pretty high powered executives and there's been a lot of like clash, but it's like, no, if, if you, you, your goal is to connect with people, you want to become more relatable, you want to drive business, you know, well then you have to expose you as a human. Mm. And that means in your biography, talking about what makes you human, things that where you're imperfect. And so as a requirement, I don't like working with people who only want to create this, like, I'm an amazing influencer overnight and look at me. Like, that's just not what I connect with. Yeah. And so I think there's enough authentic people who could, as you said, open up that window a little bit and, and let people, let people in I, six I, foot I, apart, I, six, I, social distancing. That's two meters here. Two meters, six foot, about the same, isn't it? Do you know what I was going to say as well? I think that the, especially my generation, some millennials and Gen Z, Gen Z are a different breed. Those kids grew up on iPads, right? And you see yeah. babies now swiping. I was on the train, isn't it? Here's a quick story. I was on the train and this lady, the baby had got the lady's phone uh, and just playing with the phone, swiping through photos and turned it around. There was nudes, nudes on the phone. And my mum was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I was like, that was really awkward. But the baby, the, the point of the story was the baby knew to go through the phone, find the embarrassing photos, turn it around and show random strangers. But that's, they're so switched on. Anyway, that's the point. Um, they can smell bullshit a mile away. And I'm not even, you should see, I use TikTok because uh, it's the next thing, right? They've got their own language on there and any advertisers on there and any marketers advertising, they go in the comment section, they just take the mic and they, they you know, someone goes, hey, cryptocurrency, rah, 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 I've got this software, all the comments that people taking the piss because they can smell it. They, they, they're grown up in that world where, you know, they can see your bullshit and they, they can tell when you're acting and they can, they will actively call you out on it now as well. Not just avoid it, they'll actively call you out. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, what you're doing, the sort of work you're doing is very important right now because if you're not doing that and you're not getting with the times, you're just falling behind, right? And people are just not going to register you even exist. Um, and if you do, you, know, you put out a fake pretense uh, persona, you know, you're going to get the, the 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 clash, the the people coming back and calling you out. And I don't think that's, yeah, I think it's important. Yeah, I, I think generally people don't want to do business with businesses. They want to do business with people. And that's why influencer marketing is so effective because you don't want to buy from a corporation. You want to buy the the problem that the corporation solves for you. And if it and if you have somebody that looks like you want to look and has a lifestyle that you want to live, and they're holding on to that thing, it, it makes you drawn to it. So, you know, I think brands have been using personal brands of famous people for a long time. I think the shift that we're going to see is that those companies that empower their employees to develop their own personal brands for them to be their own unique voice, but also a de facto representative of the company. I think that's where you're going to see this new mesh. I've been calling it for a long time. And now that everyone is sort of understanding that we are in this digital world, like how do you relate and connect with people as a leader in a company? You start putting yourself out there. You start sharing the lessons that you've learned. And I think when you do that, people will get to know you. And if they know you, they make a choice whether they like you or not. Hmm. And if they like you, they just might trust you. And if they trust you, you might create loyalty. And at the end of the day, we do business with people that we're loyal to. We, yeah. we, we stick by their side. I feel like I skipped over a chapter with you here because karate is a big thing. You're, are you a black belt now? Yeah, yeah. I've uh, So I initially... It was, a, it was a solution from my father uh, to solve the problem of being bullied. And it really did solve the problem because martial arts at an early age made me realize that you can't not communicate. Everything about you, whether you're speaking or not, is communicating. And I learned that I was communicating weakness. I was communicating a victim. I, I, was, I was turned off to what I knew I could stand up and do. So martial arts taught me to avoid conflict mm -hmm. by showing confidence and that was really empowering and when i got into uh, financial struggles after the mortgage crisis that and i couldn't find a job that my my profession was dried up i went back to martial arts and i started as an instructor teaching these young kids how they can be confident and so that was really empowering and that led to um 
this whole concept of bully buster workshops and just that's the mesh between performance and, and, and active. And I came up with a bully form because kids need to understand um, like in simple terms. Mm -hmm. So I have this 10 point bully form to teach them the physicalities that will help them through being bullied. Uh, and, and it was just super inspiring. And I did that for, uh, I did that in a pinch and I ended up teaching for like seven years. I was growing these multi-million dollar companies and I'd leave and go teach four-year-olds like in the middle of the day. And it was just, it was super refreshing. Um, I also boxed in college. Uh, I taught Muay Thai kickboxing for a short while. I wanted to go to Thailand and just fight and get beat up and beat people up. Like there's something about that. You know, as a wrestler in high school, there's something about that combat that, that you know, oh, it's just, it's exciting to, to get hit and hit people and it'd be like stakes on the line. So I, I just enjoy that type of combat. And I think it's always been a good release for me. Mm -hmm. I, so, I mean, there's quite a lot of parallels between uh, kids getting bullied and having to deal with it in offices. You're saying that you, the way you convey yourself and the way in which you stand and present yourself, I'm imagining that that translates over to or working in an office or, you know, feeling you haven't got the confidence to stand up to your boss or make moves and ask for that promotion, all that sort of stuff. I feel like yeah. this, this, no, this work, workplace is bullying. Yeah. Workplace bullying is real. And like, sure. I got over my childhood bullying, but the, the gentleman that, that, uh, and I can think back to some specific business partnerships where I was bullied. I mean, when you have uh, who is your equal yelling at you, slamming doors, like that's intimidating and that maybe backs you off. And then, a red flag goes unnoticed and, and there's a whole series of things that trickle from it. So it really comes down to awareness. And if you learn to avoid the situations that'll be dangerous and you learn what to do in situations that might be confrontational, there's nothing more powerful. I mean, especially like right now in today's day and age, like if you get confronted by the police, like what do you do? How do you show respect and confidence? If you are, you know, standing up for something that you believe in, are you going to stand like this? Are you going to stand like that? Like it all comes to how you communicate yourself. And in the workplace, you can look around and see people who are cowardly, even on Zoom. Again, it all comes back to being aware and, and choosing, you know, your, your ability to communicate in a very strategic way. Yeah. Uh, and it's not manipulation. It's understanding. It's, it's learning to take body signals and cues. Um, my third TEDx talk was about the power of the pause. So much happens when you don't say anything and people just sort of jump on top of each other in conversations. I guess where are we up to now? We're up to, we figured out what the, I keep saying Jedi and cause it's easier than saying karate cause I, I, I just fine. murmur my words. Um, and then you've got your app to been built and then you've gone on to uh, this go fast forward a bit. So you've gone into insurance, you've been successful, you started a business that went on its ass and you've started a second business and that's some dodgy guy. And then where we are, we are. And then, and are then I, I was, I was brought to university of California uh, in Irvine to start their undergraduate entrepreneurship program. Okay. And that's where I just really was able to take all the lessons that I learned and package it into a Socratic method of consulting. I, I never ask people, uh, or I, I never answer whether or not a, an idea is good because everybody wants to say, Ryan, is this a good idea? How would I know? Mm -hmm. I can help you find out if it's good or not. Who has the problem that you're trying to solve? Will it solve it for them? And are they, are they somebody that has a problem? So in a very way of teaching people to fish, um, that's, that's how it worked. And the center just blew up, blew up so much that I actually thought I was being fired because we were making seven foot paper airplanes, throwing them off the top for like good gifts. Um, you know, I created a Snapchat ghost and, and had a whole Snapchat um, find them in class. I got professors pissed off at me. I got administrative calls, all this stuff. But what I did is I kind of stirred up the campus and everybody would see. And then it became a place to bring your idea. We helped 2,400 students start their companies in less than 18 months. Amazing. We built a 15,000 mailing list of, of community members and students that were interested in entrepreneurship. And I got called in and I thought I was going to get fired. And that was the moment where I was like, again, I'm out. And like that phone call that you had, right? Like everything flashes and you're like, that's it. That's when I decided I was going to start building my personal brand. Mm. 
but they didn't fire me. They created a new position. So then I sat on top of 20 different programs in undergraduate education, and now they've moved me up and I work with the vice provost. But during that time, that's when I got serious about building my brand. And that's where I built uh, a company influence tree with Leonard Kim, who is my co-author in this book. But as a process of really writing the book about three year process, actually, I really got to know who he was. And I found that that relationship actually was flawed. And so uh, yet again, after building a business for five years and and authoring a book um, in December of 2019, I've decided to part ways and I respect Leonard, but I'm no longer working with Leonard. Mm. So now it's like I have a divorce business partner with a co-parenting child. That's a book. And again, reinventing one more time. But here's the thing. I'm not reinventing anything yeah. because I've built a personal brand. I've always put myself in front. Mm-hmm. It's my insurance policy. So I don't feel like I've lost traction. If anything, I've gained speed. And so again, it goes back to whether, whether you work with somebody who works or not, What's most important is that you keep pulling on the threads and the strings and, and building that sweater based on, you know, what you've learned. So I, I'm, I'm really excited. I've never been happier, healthier, and more confused all at the same time. <laughs> that brings us to today. So what's, so what's next then? You, so you're currently lecturing, oh no, so you're currently working with the university. Um, yeah, so I work with the university. I also teach at Cal State Fullerton. Um, I also teach um, public agencies uh, how to be strategic. Um, I also teach at UCI during for their extension. So um, there's a whole education spot to it, Mm -hmm. but also there's the professional speaking. So I've been doing keynotes for years and that's moving to digital keynotes and digital workshops. Yeah. I think one of my, an exciting passion project that I've decided to work on during the quarantine is launching a stick figure store. I I can't say that. A stick figure store. How, uh, yeah. how are you going to sell that? Are you going to sell art or are you going to sell actual stick figures? So I'm going to sell everything from, from art to clothing to a pair, just all kinds of different stuff. So huh? it's an exercise. I've built the website. Uh, I'm learning e-commerce. I'm, I'm connecting all the dots. Like it's a fun exercise, <laughs> but I've been drawing stick figures for five years, thousands yeah. of them, but I've never made them available. And they will now be available for purchase in different forms and shapes. And I'm going to use that as an engine to feed charitable causes that I'm passionate about. So I'm like, it's really exciting to, to have that soon. It's like, yeah. I'm the person who's developing it. So there's a couple bugs still. But yeah, my next big project uh, is more of a charity play to, to give back and uh, have people get my stick figures and also support some good causes. Amazing. Um, I, I, so uh, that brings us to the future. So yeah, I guess the last question uh, I always ask is if you can go back uh, and speak to yourself whilst you're 15 years old, um, that's the age we come out of school in the UK, but I guess that's sort of the same over there. So you just sort of leaving uh, high school. What advice would you give yourself? It's a great question. Um, aside from, Aside from being a very early adopter on all the main platforms right now, <laughs> that would be a given. I'd say like, you know, as soon as you hear about these things, like be an early adopter, <laughs> as soon as you hear about Bitcoin, invest, because there's always that like that laggard. Um, but the advice that I would give myself is to not be so hard on myself. And we didn't talk about my, my, prof- my almost professional goalie career. I was an ice hockey goalie for 15 years. Started as a forward. They said, you suck. So I became a defenseman. They're like, you're no good at that. So I became a goaltender and I just like thrived. I just like, ah, you cannot get in here. And (laughs) as a goaltender, when you let a puck in, it's your fault. No matter what it could be, it's no one's fault, but your own. And so at an early age, I just sort of started taking on this pressure. Like we lost the game. No, I lost the game. No, no, we lost. No, I lost the game. Uh, my mom trying to help me with homework. I remember snapping at her saying, what are you doing? I, you don't think I can do this by myself? Just like, because I was just, I, I gave, I, I created such a high standard for myself. Mm-hmm. Any and every puck that I let in was just like miserable. And I still fight that today. Like it's hard for me to, to give myself a little bit of grace and be like, it's going to be okay. I'm like, ah. So if I were to give myself a bit of advice, it would be to, uh, not be so hard on myself. And I think that would have a triggering effect um, to 
have many years where I might be a little bit happier and a little bit more carefree. Um, and it's something that I'm actively working on. I have to remind myself. We all have to remind ourselves that like, you know, it doesn't happen that it doesn't have to happen today. And when you make decisions for today, don't worry about them tomorrow. Like work with them for a while. And if they don't work out, don't be so hard on yourself. Cause if I heard this podcast of myself as if I was 15, I'd be like, Holy shit. <laughs> what, you've done all kinds of stuff, but like you genuinely look happy. Like, like you seem like you're excited about what you're doing and all roads lead to somewhere. And I think, I think we should all be a little bit kinder to ourselves. I agree. Amazing. Uh, okay. So if, if anyone wants to find you, uh, how can they get hold of you? Yeah. So you go to ryan.online. That's it. So you can go to ryan.online and you can find me, my information, if you want me to speak, if you want to check out my stick figures. And then if you're into the podcasting, which you might be because you're listening here, you can check out my two podcasts, World of Speakers and then the 313 Challenge. And if you want to learn about speaking or you want to learn about core messaging, those are two things that I put out there. And of all social platforms, I'll probably be on Twitter most often. Tweet, tweet. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ryan. Honestly, I, I genuinely feel like I've learned something, which is, I guess, why I decided to start doing this, was so I could learn things and then share that insight with other people who would be interested. Um, I appreciate you coming on today, mate. Thank you. Well, keep up the good work, man. It was great to great to meet you, and I feel like I know you a little bit. And so, <laughs> chances are, I'll, I'll end up liking you. And then, hey, we can create this trust, and we look at this as like a series of dots. And we'll look back in a couple of years and be like, do you remember that one time? <laughs> so. I appreciate you reaching out because you never know what one connection can make.